please welcome the uh, filmmakers to the stage, please. The news gets back to uh, North Korea that you've appeared in Amsterdam. What will happen? Eugene, go ahead. Oh, um, this film has already become uh, an international incident. This is actually the first time we've come out as the filmmakers who made this film. So far, this has been. It's all part of a social experiment about fighting propaganda with propaganda. And we created a whole backstory about a woman called Sabine, and we wrote her an entire biography. She's half Korean, half French, and she was visiting friends and family in Seoul, where she works sometimes as a translator. And two North Korean defectors approached her with a film that they said needed to be translated and put out to the world and she agreed to do it. And she went on YouTube, I mean, when I say she, she doesn't exist, she's a creation. And she started translating it and posting it in parts on YouTube on a channel. And we thought, would anyone ever see this? Because we can't ever go to a journalist or come out about it, it's just this entire secret project that started back in 2003. So when it got released, would anyone watch? And that was in July, no, May. May 18th, we posted the first part, and now there's, I think, 1.1 million views from no aggregation. And, and it's a great relief today to say that we made the film, and we don't have to pretend anymore that this character created it and did it. And, we thought many things would go wrong, and they have. Uh, Eugene, who's South Korean, and uh, is a bomb expert, actually, uh, a demolition engineer, um, was recognized by someone in the South Korean community back in New Zealand, where we're from. We're from New Zealand, by the way. And they went to the Korean embassy in New Zealand, and I got a phone call from the consul at the Korean embassy. Are we North Korean agents? Who are we working for? What is this? And I thought, my God, it's over. Okay, this is done. Uh, okay, listen, this is just a, it's a mockumentary. It's satire. There's no problem. Eugene's a good guy. We get a phone call the next day, and it's very, very different. And we're told it's now with the KCIA, Korean Central Intelligence Agency. I'm accused of being a North Korean spy, and I still am. Eugene most certainly is, and uh, Mike as well. We've been publicly being called North Korean agents, and that's how it stands at the moment. So this today is a really good moment because if there are any journalists present, um, we're not North Korean spies, and Eugene needs his life back. Eugene. <laughs> So I'll introduce you now that you've blown your own cover for, for a project which has lasted, I think, six years. Uh, nine. nine years, my God. Uh, it's, it was a fantastic um, subterfuge under which you, you um, created the project and worked and worked and worked. Uh, um, Slavka Martinov, Slavka, and Mike Kellen, please welcome them from New Zealand. No, 
No, it's kind of uh, figuring out how to reveal the reveal. It's a, we have kept things quite secret here at ITFA, uh, so you wouldn't have to spoil your own moment. I, I think it's a kind of brilliant in the kind of uh, spirit of the yes men who we, we've had here on the stage too, and, and they're kind of subterfuge. You have as a kind of uh, uh, a mandate for your company, something I really admire. Uh, we're in the business of subversive transmedia storytelling. Everything we do is defined by compulsive dissent, challenging, unsettling, stirring, questioning, and even uh, breaking the status quo. You've done that very well. Hierarchies that don't serve the people and cancerous power structures everywhere while subverting uh, and bending the genres in the process. You certainly have with this mockumentary done that. I, I made a film with Chomsky uh, called Manufacturing Dissent. This is nice to have this as a kind of uh, the grandchild of, of the of film, which was also about propaganda and the filtering of uh, propaganda. Uh, how did you, uh, maybe both uh, Slavka and Mike can respond to this. You have your mic there. Mike, uh, yeah, you can use that one. Uh, how, how did you really, nine years ago, really start thinking that this film had to be made? Um, in 2003, I got it in my head that uh, I needed to make a film about propaganda because I realized that most people think of it as something from the Cold War era or World War II and that it no longer exists. But of course, it's more powerful and more refined, that same recipe that was devised in 1914 than it ever has. So I thought, okay, if I can make a film, and I'd never made a film before, by the way, they wouldn't let me into film school, unlike Mike here. Um, I thought I have to make a film about propaganda, but I don't think anyone would look at a dry film about propaganda. Here's the recipe, here's how it's used. So I thought, how can I create a film that would get people's attention? And I thought, well, how about a film that's intercepted from another country discovered, but it actually critiques Western propaganda. Which country would do this? North Korea is just so obvious. And so I started researching and writing in secret. And then in 2005, I told Mike one day, I've got an idea. And I pitched it to him and he got it right away and, and we kept it secret all I that I time. I didn't actually get it straight away. It took me, it took me a wee while. Yeah. <laughs> It yeah, well, I think it's such an out there idea that you don't know whether it's going to work until it's until you actually put it together. Yeah, but, and um, it kept having to be revised, and re it took a long time because um, you could never get funding for it. You could never get any kind of help, and you have to keep it completely secret. So it was just between the two of us over that time, and it was many, many years before. There's a logic to it. You're like okay, well, somewhere along the line, I'm going to write the script, but I'm going to have to get it translated. I live in Christchurch, New Zealand. How the hell am I going to go under the radar and find a Korean translator? It started off as a translation. Eugene translated it, but when we met him, we just kind of knew this guy can act, even though he's never acted before. And... Uh, and we're very, very lucky knowing Eugene, who keeps a good secret. Yeah. What's your side of the story, Eugene? My side of story, right, okay. For the record, by the way, I'm from South Korea, and I'm not North Korean professor. Um, when I had a call from Slavko um, some time ago, um, he didn't tell me anything about the film. He just simply said, um, Let's have a coffee. Um, someone reco you know, uh, recommended me as a translator, uh, translating something. He asked me to come out for a cup of coffee. He was a little bit chubbier than he is now. But he, he had no hair, of course. And um, it was kind of peculiar why he wants me to translate something he can't explain. So, okay. But well, anyway, anyway, um, okay, let's find out. Let's go further. Um, so I agreed to uh, translate the transcript. 
and um, it will start from there. And um, following um, a week or two weeks after, he asked me to act, which I never did. I know my life was up and down quite a bit. I can take it as a, you know, um, acting, but not paid acting. So um, it was, was a challenge, actually. I'm an um, explosive demolition engineer, blowing buildings and bridges, and uh, frigate in a warship, but never acted before in front of camera. And it was a, it was a, a very good experience. And um, after uh, finishing this film, uh, you know, my life um, went upside down, actually. Thinking about that actually made me sick. This guy asked me to act in the film. A few months later, my life was upside down. It's not just my life, my family's life, my um, sister's family's life, my mother's life, everything. Because um, the people in the community started um, to criticize me as a North Korean, real thing. And um, just one day, I'm North Korean, spy, sympathizer. That's huge, huge thing in the community. I'm still a um, North Korean spy in the community. That's actually making me sick now. Well, maybe the implications of having a screening here in Amsterdam at the uh, documentary festival, revealing the kind of the truth that's had to be covered for six years will, will help uh, restore your, uh, your status in your community as is a, is a, a Korean community in Christchurch or also in South yes, Korea as yes, well? It is. Well, it, it's not people in the community, actually. Um, we, we've got one and only um, community newspaper. Actually, we were called in to a meeting uh, organized by uh, Korean Society of Christchurch, which is representing um, you know, Koreans within the community. And um, they asked us to come, out, come along because uh, it became um, out of control. And there were about 20 people from the community, Koreans. We explained every details. We went, um, it's more than we have to actually. I would say 150% of truth. And this newspaper manipulated the story using very, very cunning technique using question mark here and there, maneuvering um, the articles in a funny way. So readers can actually read this article, making um, them think these people are not genuine and these people are North Korean sympathizer. I think that is a propaganda in question. Yes, I mean the, the great irony is that, uh, that that it is propaganda and it's being used uh, personally uh, uh, against you uh, with a film about propaganda. But um, let's, I want to get the lights up maybe if we can upstairs and then we, we have microphones uh, here on both sides of the aisles and if there are comments or critiques uh, um, or just raise your hand and we'll run the mics up there. I know the first question is always the hardest, but there's one there in the middle. Hi. Um, did you get any reaction from North Korea? Uh, there, are, there are official websites in North Korea, and they, you can tell them because they end in dot. Uh, is it dot .kp? Uh, dot yeah. There are a few North Korean uh, websites. There is one that is uh, associated with North Korea and it's based in America and it looks like the official website. And very early on they picked up on the film when it was being released in parts. And, and of course they loved it because you were actually doing their dirty work even though you're critiquing it, you're saying everything from their perspective. They're founded on 
anti-Japanese principles, for example, and their ideals of Zhusha. We were doing all of this for them, but they don't have to get their hands dirty. So it was going up on that site and, and well supported. But like anything from North Korea, you know, what do you know? Even those who are experts on North Korea admit that, that they really don't know anything. There may be some Chinese officials high up who know what who knows what really goes on in North Korea, but no official word from North Korea. And and hopefully they'd want to distan distance themselves from the project now that we're out. Yeah. Um, they might be less likely to be um, keen on it. <laughs> I, we, I had invited two filmmakers who are here with projects about no North Korea. We have invited also into the festival. One is called Camp 14. You should really see it. It's quite a strong film. And another film made by An Shin, uh, South Korean, uh, Canadian, uh, called The Defector. So there, uh, there is a kind of certain reality. I myself produced with Swedes uh, a film uh, called Maneuvers in the Dark, which was about... Uh, some young Swedish designers trying to make blue jeans in, in North Korea and the, the impossibility of that project. So uh, it'll be interesting to, to hear the rebound, we'll say, of this particular world uh, premiere screening. Please, uh, other questions? There's one right in the front there. Yes, uh, I really enjoyed the film. I really thank you for your work. Um, North Korea has been um, well known uh, for their uh, expertise in propaganda. Uh, some say that they've been able to keep the country together on a, on a war footing uh, because of American threat or Japanese threat. How did you take your study in propaganda? How much did you take? Uh, is everything taken from North Korea uh, process of work? Uh, I I studied, knowing that I was going to make the film and make it appear as if it was from North Korea, I first studied propaganda as much as I could from the Bible of Jacques Ellul's propaganda, everything I could possibly get my hands on. And then I studied North Korea as much as I could, every bit of material that was available. Um, you know, there's... Propaganda techniques, uh, there are many different types. Theirs is quite, quite overt. And there can be no critical thinking of their type of propaganda because the punishment will be so severe. We, throughout the, to answer your question, throughout the process of, of making the film, it's a constant discipline to remind yourself not to make a film as you normally would but to constantly remember if this was really made out of there, how would it look? What would be said? How would the language be used? And you have a lot of problems because you cannot possibly use the language they use. I don't know if you've ever seen the translations of the North Korean news agency. It's impossible, you just couldn't listen to it. At the beginning of the film, the text we had, our beloved leader, that's the type of language. But you can't, you couldn't sit here and listen to that throughout, you'd go, you'd go crazy. So you have to adapt the language, you have to change some things. But we were very aware of using, in the end, the last chapter, where the professor speaks in those revolutionary tones, that ties back to how they would say things. Very, very hardcore, very, very, you know, entirely unsubtle. Um, but that's normal for them. And you had to keep it in mind the whole time. Um, and maybe, maybe a style that as a Western audience you think, oh shit, they've stepped up their game now and they've taken on our kind of style of filmmaking maybe? Um, that's been an interesting thing because if you look at North Korean films or what you can see on YouTube, and people on YouTube on this film would say, ah, this doesn't seem North Korean to me, it's not like their other stuff. But of course other people would come in and say, no, they've stepped up their game. They're now doing this for a Western audience. I can see what they're doing, that's propaganda. And people fight back and forth. And we're thinking that's let us off the hook a bit because we, we didn't have all the answers. You had to fill in some of the gaps along the way. You couldn't possibly do it entirely as North Koreans would do it unless they change their game. Other questions? Yes, from the mic from the front. Uh, 
Hello, uh, I'm Jari from Finland. Nice to be here. Um, I used to work for the South Korean Air, Air Company for two years, some time ago. And um, actually, this is a comment, and then I have a question. Um, I was very fond about Korean culture and so on. And one day I decided to go to the De Carré, the famous theater here. They had a two years ago or something, three years ago, a very famous North Korean circus invited to Amsterdam. And I went to visit that and I like it very much because it's art, it's a culture. And uh, I enjoyed it very much. And next day when I came very enthusiastic back to work and I told what I have been doing after the weekend and so on and um, in that moment you know in the company culture something changed and I thought that I have becoming a spy in my own way let's put it in this way so I um, I just wanted to share with this feeling with you I don't work there anymore but the question is uh, for the director, and what are you going to do the next? What is your next work? Oh, um, first of all, the, the change in culture you noticed is very, very real for South Koreans. Um, we thought, I thought, if anything ever went wrong with this film or it caused an incident, that it would be entirely my responsibility and I'd take the fall I never realized, well, I, I did, but not the extent to which there is no acting as a North Korean for South Koreans. It's treason to pass on North Korean ideology or communist ideology. That's why Eugene's in trouble. Um, so I understand the, the change you felt because they're still in the state of war. This film is just part of a social experiment about fighting propaganda with propaganda and what you can get away with using propaganda techniques. It's actually all for a film we're making called Making Propaganda, which will be a, a documentary or a propumentary, I suppose. And it will trace the entire process of creating a propaganda, propaganda campaign, which is what we've done. And this film was just part of that. So to answer your question, we're in a constant state of making a film called Making Propaganda about it. And I personally am co-producing other films and documentaries back home and Mike's constantly busy as a cameraman and editor and, but we have quite a slate of things. Um, I'm wondering about the relationship between you as a kind of editor, cameraman and, and, and you as a director of Root Bircher and how your co-directors, I guess, yeah, and we co-produce together. And we, in the last two years, have made uh, two films together, uh, two documentaries. And uh, we do most of our work together. Yeah. How do you differentiate the role? Uh, Mike's got skill and I don't. I have <laughs> ideas, ideas pouring in all the time and I write. Uh, but if it wasn't for someone with <laughs> the great skill here to... Uh, make it happen, uh, you know, I'd be just sitting in my room with my ideas and a pen and paper. I still do most of the time. But then I can go talk to Mike and he'll be like, well, you'll need to do the following things. I'm getting better. Yeah. Compl complimentary um, skills, I think, yeah. is what the answer is. Yeah. Correct so correct we, we're better together. Yeah. yeah. And along the way, we will try in future not to get our fellow collaborators' lives turned upside down. Yeah, and that's actually no joke. I mean, I, I can't make light of that. Back home in New Zealand, this is a real problem, and I'm responsible for it. And I have to keep working now to find ways, like maybe get into other festivals and talk to journalists in order to completely undo the damage I've done by having Eugene in this film, because in our city. Uh, in 2010 we had our first major earthquake and then our big one we had in February 2011 which flattened our city and you know it's, it's tough enough 
now Eugene's gone from having such high standing in his community to people won't let their children go to school where his wife teaches and and they just won't attend board meetings where he was on the board. It, it's, it's really that bad. And, and currently, right now, I think I've said before, in public we're accused of being North Korea, Korean agents and there's nothing to change that except for today onwards coming out and telling people for the first time that we're not. Although interestingly that's quite difficult to prove because when we had the um, meeting, it was 90 minutes long with the Korean society, the three of us sat there and I was coming out and telling the truth, look, 2003 I had this idea, it's, it's a script, uh, you know, here's everything from this point in exact detail. And one of the elder ones goes, well done, you've succeeded. But the point is not that you started here and did all that you did, and we believe you, it's that you were commissioned before here by North Korea to do this film. And I thought, fuck, I hadn't thought of that. And what do I, I, I can't disprove it. And that's a problem I never en envisioned and that has now got us in trouble and, I, and I, don't, I don't have the answers to get out of it anymore. Well, it's always the problem of documentaries about questioning um, <coughs> authenticity. About four years ago here at ITFA, you have the uh, tickets you have with the, the ballots that can for vote for the most popular film. But on the flip side of it, we had placed a, a fake documentary into the program, and we asked people to uh, try to discern and figure out which one was the fake one. And on, so they wrote it in on the back of their tickets. And when we analyzed all the tickets, there were 37 documentaries that they thought were fake. And there actually really was only one. Uh, but it was a whole range of things. So I had Werner Herzog sort of choose the winner or loser. As it is, so I'm glad you've uh, added to the the genre of a mockumentary. Maybe uh, after this uh, appearance here in, at ITFA, we can maybe make a statement as the biggest documentary festival in the world that yes, it is a real documentary, uh, and you should question the truth everywhere in the in the church halls of uh, Christ Church and the Tschinski Theater as well. Any more uh, questions there? There's one at the back, please. Yeah, I was wondering if um, this is also your personal view on the Western civilization. The, the message in the movie is quite No, no grim, I understand. I'm so. just trying to <laughs> bide time and avoid answering. <laughs> There's nowhere to run. Uh, I, I think, yes. Maybe a, maybe a bolder version of what you yeah. really think so? I, no, it, it was because I had a, you know, when you start researching something, oh, I'm going to make a film about propaganda. What do I think? And all of a sudden it was a wonderful opportunity to throw in all the different things you actually do believe in order to use them for your propaganda campaign. And so, excellent question. Absolutely, everything you see on screen is my belief, I think. Um, I don't, I worry sometimes. Oh, sometimes in doing it for this film, if it was just a straight film, what do I think? Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't have been so strong. But from a North Korean perspective, you can be very strong. And um, although I think, I d I'm not a fan of Paris Hilton, I think is clear. And, um, Tara Banks, I mean, you just can't be the hypocrisy, although, um, and I deliberately went over the line with celebrities in the hope that maybe I would be sued because it would be good marketing for the film. Because you've got no budget, you've got to find new ways of, you know, getting it out there. And sue me, I don't own anything, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, those are my beliefs. But the, the North Korean sections, there's a few of those, they wouldn't be, you'd want to go on the record as saying it. Wouldn't oh, you? right, no, thank you. No, good point, yeah. No, Just in case that, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, Eugene. Yeah, Current no, situation. Sorry. Yeah, no, with some exclusions, yeah. 
Oh, yeah, no, I don't believe North Korea is the headquarters of the world revolution. Thank you. Yeah. That's what I mean by the good balance with me and Mike. He saves me sometimes. Thank you. And we have Eugene as the referee. Is this the first time that you've seen it? Well, obviously with the public, but uh, let's just maybe get some reaction and we'll get the last question in. Well, um, yeah, it, it was first time actually um, seeing from the very, you know, the beginning to the right to the end was first time. Um, yeah, it, it was actually. Um, so I just couldn't bear to watch it with everything happening you know, around me. Mm. And I'll just add um, just one comment on this gentleman's question, actually. Um, it is quite funny. Um, li Koreans living in Korea, they don't mind. They can make films about North Korea. They can talk about great leader. But it's always a problem with the people living out of the Korea. Because they haven't been exposed to um, the change of environment. They still live in when they left their country. If they move out, let's say, um, 1970, year 1970, they're still living as a, uh, 1970 Koreans. But it's not just the Koreans. All the migrants are the same, I think. Yes, um, I was wondering, uh, what do you hope uh, will emerge from this mockumentary? Uh, good question. Yeah, the purpose of it was to, and this might sound quite grandiose, but in the same way that I uh, was unaware of how effective and completely prevalent propaganda is uh, under the guise of public relations, international diplomacy, and other names. I thought, God, if, if I've gone my life not knowing this, that there's an actual recipe applied against people, uh, I felt it my duty to share that knowledge. And so, of course, you want as wide an audience as possible. So far, as part of this social experiment, because you couldn't tell anyone or go to journalists, it's just ticked along a few people, just over a million people. At this point, we don't know, which is why we're making the film, Making Propaganda. As of this moment right now, what happens? You know, does it go viral on YouTube? Uh, if a journalist now writes an article about it and, you know, a wide readership of people see it and then tell their friends, does it really take off? We really don't know what happens or at what pace. Um, hopefully, you know, I mean, who makes a film and doesn't want as many people as possible to see it? The film's for free, that's a gift to people. Um, again, that sounds a bit egotistical, but I mean, it's available on YouTube for free and hopefully people share it and connect with each other and talk about it. Um, and it, it's got people discussing and talking about propaganda, which is kind of what the point wanted to do, the point, yeah. yeah. The point was to think and that talk we're about it, yeah. Fighting propaganda, using propaganda as the best way to provoke people into really discussing how it works and what its tools are. Propaganda squared if you like. We're about at time, but I, I do predict. I saw I was watching from the sides a bit, and a few smiles at the irony. And, and now that it's now labeled as a mockumentary, it could really be a kind of viral hit for people who want to really enjoy the the irony in the film and in the way that the, our friends uh, Akbar and company made the corporation and these or our, our Akbar and I uh, the manufacturing consent. These films that really got wide, widespread audience because of people's uh, uh, dissent, I have to say, and, and uh, in the West, anyway, the, the critique of media. Uh, in one of the stats there, it said there are five corporations, only more than 50% uh, of uh, all media. I think when we made manufacturing consent, it was like eight corporations, so things are not getting better. Um, anyway, thank you very much, Slavka uh, and uh, Mike and uh, Eugene. Uh, for really being so brave for, for so many years and really holding this under wraps so you could share it here with Amsterdam. So 
A round of applause, please.